Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I'm your host, Deacon Isaac Longworth, and when I was a kid, I loved to read. In fact, I still love to read. And one of my favorite books was The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe which is one of the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. Now, even though it's a kid's book, I still love it to this day because it's able to convey such deep truths about Christianity, about life, in such a magical way through this fantasy world of Narnia. And in this book, there's a character named Edmund. And Edmund, uh, at one point, betrays his family to the evil white witch. And as a result, he becomes a traitor. Now, the White Witch comes at a certain point after Edmund has returned to his family, he's tried to ask their forgiveness, he wants to rejoin the good side, but the White Witch says that she has a claim on his blood because once a traitor, always a traitor. Now he belongs to her. And Aslan, who is the king of the good army, he kind of symbolizes Jesus, has this long conversation with the witch where he agrees to give up his life in place of Edmund. He offers to give up his blood in place of Edmund's blood. And as a result, Edmund is able to be set free. Now, as a kid reading this story, I was captivated by this idea of sacrifice, that this good king who had done nothing wrong was willing to have his blood spilt in place of of the traitorous Edmund so that Edmund could be reunited with his family and that Edmund could rejoin the good side, fight on the side of good now instead of evil. And it was the first time that I was able to understand a little bit of what Jesus had done for us on the cross, which is exactly what C.S. Lewis was trying to convey, that Jesus stepped into the place of us who had been traitors towards God, who had been sinners, and Jesus died the death that we deserved. He shed his blood on our behalf so that he could be our perfect sacrifice. We are saved by the blood of Jesus. Now, the reason I mention all this is because the saint I want to tell you about today had a huge devotion to the blood of Jesus. He loved the blood of Jesus. He did everything he could to share about the power of of Jesus' blood to everyone who he met. And his name was St. Gaspar del Buffalo. And St. Gaspar was born in the year 1786 in the city of Rome, Italy. Now, from the very moment that Gaspar entered into this world, he was struggling for his life. He was a very weak and sickly baby as a newborn. And so he was baptized that exact same day because his parents didn't know how long he would make it. But before his second birthday had come, he was again on death's door, still struggling, especially with an eye disease that basically if he was able to survive this disease, which wasn't likely, doctors didn't think that he would ever be able to see. He would be blind for life. Now, his mother was a strong Catholic woman. He was born into a Catholic family and his mom prayed to St. Francis Xavier who, if you follow along with the show, you'll know I've done an episode on him before. And through the prayers of St. Francis Xavier, Gaspar was miraculously healed. He grew up with absolutely no problems with his sight and he survived. And little Gaspar heard this story as he was growing into a boy and he had a real love and friendship with St. Francis, obviously, because this was the saint who had helped heal him when he was young. And so he wanted to be like St. Francis when he grew up. Now, because he wanted to be a priest, like St. Francis Xavier was from the time he was a kid, he tried to be as saintly as possible. And so when his parents gave him some extra spending money, he would go out and buy food for the poor. He would uh, spend a lot of his free time. Instead of playing games, he would go and pray so that he could speak with God. And he had a terrible fear of sinning. Even as a boy, he worked very hard to overcome the sins that he was tempted to in his life. In his case, uh, he was very tempted to be stubborn. He didn't like to listen to other people. He wanted things done his way. And he had uh, a bit of an anger problem. He had uh, a problem, a tendency to lash out when he was upset. And so he worked very hard to rein that in so that he could be a saint. And as soon as he was able to, Gaspar entered into school to become a priest. So when he was only 14 years old, he received what's called a tonsure, which is basically uh, where they would cut off some of his hair, 
which was a symbol of that time that he was preparing for ordination. He, re he received his tonsure. Now, in his time as a seminarian, Gaspar did well in his studies, but he didn't spend all of his time hitting the books. He actually went out to put what he was studying into action. He couldn't be constrained to stay in class for very long. He wanted to be out with the people. And so he would go out into the city and teach people catechism. He would explain the truths of the Catholic faith to those who didn't understand them. And he was so zealous in his work to leave and go out and capture people for Jesus that he earned himself the nickname by the people of Rome, the little apostle of Rome, because it was like he was trying to convert the whole city like the apostles did in Jesus's time. When he was ordained a priest, he was only 22 years old, which is super young if you think about it. But there he is, young Father Gaspar. And now that he was out of school, he was able to throw himself totally into working hard to lead the people of Rome closer to Jesus. And so he went to work right away. He founded prayer groups in churches that taught people how to pray. He especially taught people how to have a devotion to the blood of Jesus, which I mentioned earlier was a big part of his prayer life. He continued to take care of the poor and the sick in the city, just like he had when he was a boy and he had used his allowance to buy food for beggars. Now as a priest, he still continued to care for those who were sick and poor and impoverished. And he also left the bounds of his own church behind to reach people where they were at. He went out into the streets to evangelize in the marketplaces. He would set himself up on a public street and just start preaching to anyone who was passing by because he wanted to reach people who no longer went to church. And he told them about how God had created them to know him, to love him, and to serve him. That God wanted them to experience happiness forever in heaven. But because of their sins, because of the fact that they had turned their back on God, that they had left church behind, that they were involved in all of these sinful and evil things, that they had separated themselves from God and they needed a savior. And Gaspar told them about how God had sent his son Jesus to be that savior, that he had come to allow his pure blood to be spilled for them on the cross, that Jesus took their place and died in their place, offering up his blood as a perfect sacrifice in order for them to be restored to God. And that anyone who put their faith in the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross could be washed in his blood, could have their sins washed away, that they could be made pure by the powerful blood of Jesus. And he was such a good preacher, he preached with such conviction that many people listened to him. They actually turned their lives around. They came back to church. They decided to convert to the Lord. And it was a revival that was taking place in the city because of his preaching. But his priestly ministry was about to get a whole lot more difficult, even though it had just started, because Europe was quickly becoming more hostile to the church because of the rise to power of a man named Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, if you don't know all the situations about who Napoleon Bonaparte was, he's this pretty famous historical figure. But France had just gone through the French Revolution, which was this revolution that had tried to set up uh, an atheistic society, had tried to eradicate the church from France, but the revolution had failed. And afterwards, a man named Napoleon Bonaparte had risen to power. And Napoleon had begun to seize control of many different parts of Europe. At the height of his empire, he had parts of Germany, Italy, Spain, Poland, and France, of course, all in his control. Now, Napoleon knew that the French Revolution had failed to destroy the church. And Napoleon knew that he wanted to have absolute control over his people and that the church would get in the way of that. But he was smart. He knew the French Revolution had failed to destroy the church. And so Napoleon didn't try to destroy the church, but he tried to control it. And so what he did is he wanted the priests and the bishops to listen to him rather than to the Pope. And so Napoleon did this in so many different ways to try and switch the allegiance of the people from the church, from God, towards himself. 
And so Napoleon put himself in the Catholic catechism that he wanted the priests to teach their people. And in this catechism, it described Napoleon as the image of God upon earth and the Lord's anointed, which really are pretty much titles for Jesus. So Napoleon was giving himself almost this divine title in order to have control over the people. It even got to the point where Napoleon broke into the Vatican and kidnapped the Pope for refusing to submit to his wishes. And the Pope later died in captivity. Later on, Napoleon invaded again and took the next Pope prisoner as well. And so he set himself up as an enemy of the church. And Father Gaspar knew that Napoleon was hungry for power over the church in Rome and that he wanted the priests there to be more loyal to him than to God. And so when Napoleon required all the priests in that area to sign an oath of allegiance to him, an allegiance that the Pope had forbidden any of the priests to sign, Father Gaspar refused. He said, I'm not doing it. And when the government heard of his choice, they began to pressure him. They began to threaten Father Gaspar to change his mind. And they said things to him like, you know, think of all your ministries. Think of all your preaching and, and taking care of the poor. Who will, who will take this up if you're gone? If you refuse to sign this allegiance, then you will go to prison. It's just a piece of paper. Just sign it and it'll be fine. And even though some of his brother priests were signing that oath in order to keep their ministry going, Father Gaspar knew that he would not do something evil, even for a good thing like keeping his ministry, because he trusted that if he was obedient to God, that God would sort it out. And when manipulation and pressure didn't work, they threatened him. They threatened Father Gaspar with exile or even imprisonment if he refused to cave. And Father Gaspar's only response was, I cannot, I must not, and I will not. And so as a result of his stubbornness, he was banished from Rome to a city in northern Italy. And the stress of the exile from being forced out of his home, uh, the harsh climate of the new city triggered his poor health. All of this together, he almost died as a result of all of this stress in his life. But he eventually survived. And seeing that even his harsh exile had not gotten him to cave, the police decided to up their threats and they actually arrested him and sent him to prison. And in this prison, it was truly horrible conditions. It was a disgusting prison full of bugs and mold and filth from all the prisoners who had lived in there before him. And especially for Father Gaspar, there was rats everywhere, which was a special fear for him. He hated rats. He hated rodents. Maybe you're listening in and you're like, I agree with St. Gaspar here. I don't like rats either. But just imagine how terrible it was for him to live in this place surrounded by these vermin that he was so afraid of. It was hot and suffocating in the summer. It was freezing in the winter. And it was very demoralizing for him because his brother priests, even those who had gone to prison with him, eventually began to weaken under the pressure, and they began to cave. And if things weren't bad enough, poor Gaspar lost his mother while he was in prison. She died, and he was very close with her. He wasn't able to mourn her properly, wasn't able to visit her, wasn't able to even go to the funeral. And so in this place of darkness, Gaspar was tempted to despair. He was tempted to think, has God abandoned me? Am I even making the right decision? Am I being stubborn for the sake of being stubborn? Or am I doing the right thing by not signing this oath of allegiance to Napoleon? But it was in this same darkness that he once again returned to his love for the blood of Jesus. And this was very consoling to him because he was able to connect with Jesus who had suffered for him. And now Gaspar was able to suffer in return. And he gave this suffering to Jesus and felt united to him because of it. Well, eventually, Napoleon ended up losing his power and Father Gaspar received the news that he would be set free. He had not caved. He had not buckled under the pressure. And now God had won him the victory. 
And so he had this triumphant return to Rome where Father Gaspar, true to his nature, launched himself right back into work. It was almost like he had to make up for all the time that he had lost in jail. And he got together a small group of other priests, and they all together made a promise that wherever they went, no matter what they did, they would spread devotion to the blood of Jesus. It was a very small group, only about four priests in it at the beginning, and they began to call themselves the missionaries of the precious blood. And these guys began to travel throughout Italy. They would lead missions where they preached with power, where they preached with conviction, calling people to give their lives to Jesus, calling on them to repent of their sins, that because of the suffering of Jesus, because of the blood that he had shed for them, they now had this opportunity to turn back to God. And they pleaded with the people, don't waste this opportunity. Turn to God now. Turn to him in faith. The blood of Jesus can wash you clean of your sin. It can save you. It can make you new. You can be a new person because of Jesus's blood. And this mission work really took off. More priests began to join them. In fact, this, this community still exists today. And it got to the point where Father Gaspar was preaching up to five times a day. Five times a day, he would go around preaching at different parishes, preaching in the streets. And eventually, it got to the point where so many people were coming to him and they would be so moved by his preaching that he had to travel with 50 priests who would hear confessions after he spoke. He would speak with such power that hundreds and thousands of people would want to go to confession after his preaching and he needed 50 priests just to keep up with the massive repentance that was happening. One of the most insane mission trips that he went on was to a group of dangerous bandits called the Brigands. The Brigands was basically a group of outlaws who lived in the mountains, and uh, they made their livelihood by stealing from travelers. They would rob people. Uh, they murdered people. They ran criminal activity in the cities, and everyone was terrified of them. They had grown so powerful at this point that they even controlled some towns in Italy. They were kind of like uh, that time's version of modern day gangs or the mafia or cartels or, or criminal syndicates. Like these guys were bad and they were responsible for so much crime and murder and violence in the area. Now, Father Gaspar knew that the brigands were dangerous, but he wasn't intimidated. He knew that he had Jesus on his side and he set out to win them for God. And he went to their headquarters and he spoke to them of God's mercy, that God was willing to forgive any sin that they had done in their past, that they could have their past lives of thieving and murder washed away by the blood of Jesus. And the brigands listened to him. Just like everyone else, they were moved by this saint. They were moved by his, his speech, by his way of living, and there was huge conversions. They came up to him in crowds and laid their guns at his feet, promising to never rob again, never to steal or murder, and to reform their lives. Now, obviously, most people were overjoyed at the conversion of the brigands because they no longer had to travel around in fear for their lives when they were traveling. And Gaspar's work had brought so many people in that community to Jesus. But not everyone was happy that he had converted the brigands. In fact, Father Gaspar made some enemies by doing so. One of the enemies that he made were corrupt city officials. These were guys who had made money from being bribed by the brigands. And they began to lose money because they no longer were getting their cut from organized crime. And so these city officials who had been corrupted, they did everything they could to get Gaspar out of the way from meddling with their criminal lifestyle. And so what they did is they spread lies about him to try to get him suspended from his priestly work. And when that didn't work, because no one believed their lies anyways, they tried to get Father Gaspar this cushy promotion in the church. They wanted to get him bogged down doing all this office work and traveling so that he wouldn't have any time to preach. But Father Gaspar defeated them by his humility because he basically went to his boss and said, look, I, I'm not good enough to have this kind of, of promotion. 
I'm just a simple priest. All I can do is travel around and preach. And so his humility won the day and they didn't have the chance to move him. And so despite all of their efforts, Gaspar, his character proved himself in the long run. And he continued to travel around preaching and teaching, leading people to love the blood of Jesus. Now, in his work, he wasn't just convincing because of his words, but because many supernatural signs and wonders began to happen within the context of his preaching. And this is because God was stepping in with his sovereign power to prove the truth of Father Gaspar's words by backing up his preaching with miraculous power. So one of the miraculous things that happened with Father Gaspar is that he had the ability to bilocate, which means he was able to be in two places at once. There are many different witnesses who heard him preaching to a crowd of hundreds of people, while at the exact same time, there was other people that said that they were going to confession with him inside the church. And so he was both preaching outside the church and hearing confessions inside the church at the same time. There was many times where he would heal people. There was one woman who was healed just from touching his clothing. He didn't even have to pray for her, but just by touching him, she was able to experience the healing power of God flow through him. There were several times when he was in danger and he was divinely protected. Once he was uh, walking through the streets and there was this mentally disturbed woman who surprised him by throwing a pot of boiling water at him out of the window. And even though he was doused in water by this, by this woman, there was no burns on him. The boiling water didn't affect him at all, and he was able to go on his way completely fine. Father Gaspar also had the gift of tongues, which means that when he was preaching, people who even didn't speak Italian were able to hear him in their own language. He would be preaching, and people would be able to hear him in their own native dialect, even though he wasn't speaking that. And crowds were so big that they could barely see him, and yet they could hear him perfectly. So they would be in this crowd, they could barely see Father Gaspar, he was so far away, and yet when he spoke, it was like he was right beside them speaking into their ears. It was this great miracle that allowed his preaching to be heard by many. And finally, he also had the miracle of levitation. He was once preaching in a public square, and the crowd began to watch in amazement as he actually physically lifted off the ground while he was preaching. And I, I wonder why God did this. Maybe God wanted to give everyone a better view of this saint. So he, you know, lifted him up in the air, but he had all of these miracles breaking out in his ministry, not because of his own power, but because God wanted to use these miracles to show people that St. Gaspar had something important to say and that they should listen to him and convert their lives. Now, eventually, Father Gaspar worked himself to the point of exhaustion. He became weaker and weaker. But even in this state of sickness, he couldn't hold himself back from serving others. And so when a cholera epidemic broke out, he was one of the first volunteers who leapt into action to serve the dying and the sick, to give them not only physical care, but to hear their confessions, to give them the anointing of the sick, to even on their deathbed, try to evangelize them and share with them about the power of the blood of Jesus. And while he was doing this work, because he was in so much close contact with these sick patients, he himself became sick and died of the plague when he was only 51 years old. And the physician who attended him told others of his death and said that he was a victim of charity. He had given himself completely to others, even to the point of giving up his life to serve the needs of those who were sick. Now, St. Gaspar lived his whole life out of love for Jesus with a special love for his precious blood, which is something that we can imitate. Because St. Gaspar understood that because of the blood of Jesus, we can come close to God again. Like it says in the Bible, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, that now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so by putting our faith in the sacrifice of the Lord, 
who proved his love for us by dying a bloody death on the cross for us, we can be washed of our sin. We can be made pure in God's eyes. We can become saints. St. Gaspar got this. He knew that only the blood of Jesus could save people from their sin, and that's why he preached that good news to everyone, that the precious blood of Jesus had rescued him and that it could rescue the whole world. And so I want to imitate St. Gaspar here and, and give you the opportunity to respond to the sacrifice of Jesus. Maybe this is something that you've heard about. Maybe you've been raised in the Christian life, or maybe this is something brand new, but I want to give you the opportunity to join with me in prayer, to put your faith in the blood of Jesus. And so I invite you to pray with me now, Lord Jesus, I thank you so much that even though I was in rebellion towards God, even though I had walked away from him, even though I had broken my relationship with him through my sin and all the wrong that I've done in my life, Jesus, you came to die for me anyways. And you loved me when I was at my worst and you decided to go to the cross. You decided to be beaten, to be crowned with thorns, to be nailed to a cross, to suffer on my behalf so that I could be set free. Jesus, I believe that the blood that you spilled for me actually worked, that your death was the perfect sacrifice that made it possible for me to come back to God. And you have now opened up heaven for those who put faith in you. And so Jesus, I put faith in you today. And I ask that you would forgive me of all of my sins, of all of the wrong things that I've done, and that you would wash me clean that you would wash me white as snow by your precious blood. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your sacrifice. And I promise from this day forward to live my life for you.